Aloha and welcome to Cooper Union, what's happening with human rights around the world. And today we're gonna to be looking at a global movement known as the UN Sustainable Development Goals, as well as its method for accountability, the UN Voluntary National Reviews, and the UN High Level Political Forum, where at least over 40 countries have their advancements measured and monitored by civil society, but also their peers around the world, the member states, to see how we're doing to achieve the UN 2030 agenda. Today, I'm fortunate enough to be joined by Oli Hinman, NGO Major Group and Action for Sustainable Development. Oli, thank you for joining us today here in Hawaii. Thanks so much, Joshua. It's great to be able to connect with you uh, through the, the Zoom link. Uh, I wish I could be there in person, but it's fantastic to connect with you. We wish you could as well. Uh, we know here in Hawaii, we've been focusing on the UN Sustainable Development Goals and when we didn't have as good of a national leadership as we were discussing earlier, we were able to pursue even more creative uh, venues such as voluntary local reviews. But uh, maybe we could share with the audience, what are the UN Sustainable Development Goals? How did they cr get created? And why are they so crucial for a common future? Sure, I mean, that's a great place to start. Um, I mean, I think you and I were both uh, very active at the time back in 2015 when, uh, as you say, there was a different leadership in the world. Uh, we had a key kind of understanding between some of the leadership in the US under Obama, the European Union, uh, and also crucially the Chinese around that time to agree on a package of uh, development aims and ambitions um, that would frame the next 15 years from 2015 through to 2030. Um, and these goals are to kind of build on what had been in place before, which were the Millennium Development Goals. And there was also the Rio Earth uh, process, the Rio Plus 20 process. And they brought those two together. So you had the kind of more traditional development side, which includes areas like education and health and gender equality, uh, together with climate and environmental targets and biodiversity targets and bringing those together into a kind of blueprint for a more just and sustainable world. So connecting all of these different elements uh, in terms of rights, in terms of sustainability, in terms of climate and biodiversity. And within those, there are now 17 goals. Within those 17 goals, there are a series of indicators that all countries are supposed to achieve by the time we get to 2030 uh, in order to be on track to reach that world that is more just and sustainable. Um, the climate targets, for example, tie in very closely with the Paris Agreement. Um, the human rights targets tie in closely with the agreements that go on at the Human Rights Council at the UN. Uh, the gender targets tie in with some of the discussions that have been happening at the Generation Equality Forum uh, just now. So it's really a way to connect the dots between all of these different uh, aspects of an agenda to create that um, more, uh, that fairer and more sustainable world that we all, uh, that we're all striving for. Oh, those are really good explanation. And in, in many ways, it does sort of fall into four building blocks, right? For a building back better and balance and beauty. You know, the first ones are sort of economic, social, and cultural rights. Those second ones, sort of a fair economy. Third one's looking at really the, the climate and what needs to be done to protect our planet. And the fourth one is peace, justice, human rights, and then partnering together in new ways beyond those traditional. And, and I thought that was a great way also to link up with gender in the most recent summit that just took place in Paris, and then also bringing up again the Paris Agreement from 2015. And many had forgotten about the Millennium Development Goals, those important eight but bringing those together with the real plus 20 that really only had five, it was a lot of advancement by civil society to have to reach that 17. Would you like to share some of the aspect of that organizing between that 2012 and 2015 to expand those to that really impressive 17 uh, global goals? Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's a great summary, uh, Joshua, in terms of, as you say, like the people, planet, prosperity, and then peace and partnerships. Absolutely. They sometimes talk about the sort of four or five Ps um, as those kind of key areas, as you say. Um, and, and what was interesting, yeah, thinking back to the way it was negotiated, um, as you as you probably remember, there had been quite a lot of discussions around the Rio Plus 20 uh, summit. And then you had this kind of gradual move, as you say, from 2012 through to 2015, where the UN began a process mandated by the General Assembly, where they um, identified what they call the co-facilitators, so like a co-chairs, moderators to run the process. 
And those people then organized a series of consultations and dialogues with what's called the major groups and other stakeholders. And you, you mentioned at the start that I'm involved and one of the organizers of the NGO major group. And so under the original agreement in the Rio Earth Summit, I think going back to 92, they had nine uh, groups that were identified, nine major groups. And so NGOs being one, uh, women uh, being one, indigenous peoples being one, trade unions, um, farmers have their own group, um, business and industry, science and technology. So many of the sort of key um, areas, constituencies, if you like. But then what was agreed um, around 2013, 2014 during the negotiations was that the original nine were not actually sufficient. So we've gradually expanded on those and, and the additional stakeholder groups include, for example, disability rights, uh, LGBTI, uh, volunteers, older persons. Um, so you now have an even broader range of now 21 different stakeholder groups that are identified, although the NGO major group is still one of the biggest of those and, and perhaps one of the most organized. And what we try to do is to connect with uh, different NGO networks in every part of the world, particularly where you have a national uh, coalition or you have a grouping that is already active within a country that wants to connect with others. And we try to uh, bring together those different voices and enable them to then come forward at the UN spaces. And so we then have an internal process where we identify different speakers for different sessions. And so throughout that negotiation, we were able to bring in different voices from different parts of the world who might have an interest or knowledge in some of those key areas that we've talked about. So whether it's on forest uh, stewardship, we might bring in people directly with experience in the Amazon, or if it's on gender equality, um, those working on women's rights, we might then involve them directly in that part of the negotiation. So it's, it's always been a collaborative process. And I think that's, you know, that's been one of the key things in terms of how we self-organize and that it's not something that the UN decides who will speak on each issue, but we as uh, stakeholders um, have the right to uh, identify from our own kind of peers who are the, the best place to, to in, engage on each of these different uh, themes. Well, those are really good points. It reminds me also, I think it was Kenya and Ireland that were chairing then through that exactly. time. And those chairs were really looking to civil society. And I remember some of the meetings we'd have, he would actually have a day where he says, no, you know, the states, you know what you see, but actually civil society in some case has the expertise to guide us through to create those 17 global goals. And I didn't know if you might have a story about one of those chairs or some aspect remembering, because it is true, it's NGOs picking really the people who have the best experiences and the knowledge to be able to then come up with those global goals, but then figuring out what we do on the ground and bringing those best promising practices to the global level. Absolutely right. And and I'm glad you mentioned those two co-facilitators. Yeah, I mean, as you say, it's always uh, two ambassadors and normally they have one from the global north, one from the global south. And in this case, yeah, it was Ambassador David Donahue from Ireland and Ambassador Kamal from Kenya, who were both excellent and very uh, engaging and very open and very, uh, as you say, um, candid in how they dealt with civil society, saying, look, guys, we, we don't have all the answers. We need you to help us. And I think particularly the language around leaving no one behind, which we know has made such a big difference in terms of the SDG. So leaving no one behind has become a kind of cross-cutting uh, principle across all the 17 goals that whatever we do in each of these key thematic areas, we need to ensure that those who are normally furthest behind are then put first and that they're not left behind. And I remember talking to David Donahue, the Irish ambassador, and he said exactly that, that some of the language that actually made it into the final version of the text was provided by NGOs because we had that experience and many of our different networks have that experience of working with some of the most vulnerable communities. And so they, they know how to frame it in such a way that builds trust and that guarantees that those voices really are being heard. Oh, that was amazing because I do remember it was this August session was those midnight all-nighters with people uh, sleeping in the lounge uh, right behind the meeting room, pizzas being delivered because NGOs couldn't leave, but it was really people working. I know Palau was really working hard on uh, SDG 6 to, to clean water, and it, it was exciting. And then what was exciting with the adoption in September 
of course, around the UN General Assembly, the official adoption, was we then started looking at processes on how states would then report. And what was agreed upon was these voluntary national reviews. And I know every year it's around 40 countries that raise their hand and say, I will pledge to do my voluntary national review. And could you share a little bit about what the VNRs are and, and how those have been used to be able to advance the 2030 agenda? Yeah, so, I mean, as we, as we said earlier, with 17 goals, um, there are more than 160 targets uh, and many different indicators that sit within those. Um, and some countries have slightly different indicators because not every country has exactly the same uh, kind of um, baseline, if you like, where they're starting from. So um, what we did find early on, and you probably remember this, Joshua, that a number of member states said, oh, you know, there are just too many targets there's no way we're going to be able to report on all of these. And, you know, it's going to be too costly. And there was quite a big push at the last minute to try to reduce them down. But that was resisted partly by the co-facilitators. So, yeah, so then the agreement came, as you say, on uh, all of the goals and targets. And then the idea was that every year governments should come back and report on their progress on these 169 targets. And so, as you say, um, the voluntary national reviews are voluntary. So each government can choose when they want to report, um, and they should uh, report against all of the goals and all of the targets. Now, unfortunately, uh, we know um, that you know a number of uh, member states have used the excuse of it being too many goals. And also, one of the things that I think was not a bit unexpected was that as part of the annual cycle of the high-level political forum, which meets in July, as you said, um, as well as the voluntary national reviews, there are also thematic reviews happening at the same time. And I think that's led to a little bit of confusion with some member states, because some member states seem to think that they only have to review the goals that are under thematic review, um, whereas actually they're supposed to be two separate processes. One process is a thematic review, say, for example, on human rights this year or on clean water, as you said, but the VNRs are supposed to cover all goals. and so. We've seen a bit of a mix, and it's been a bit of a mixed picture over these five, six years now, where different governments have reported sometimes on all the goals, sometimes only picking some goals, sometimes picking the goals that they think they're doing better on and not talking about the goals they're not doing so well on. So it's 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 a bit of a tricky one. That the There isn't such a strong accountability mechanism. And actually, I was also told by some of the negotiators at the time that the word accountability was deliberately dropped from the text. They didn't want to have that word. They talk about voluntary, state-led process, they talk about reviews, and they talk about follow-up, but they don't actually talk about accountability. So there's no there's no requirement there. It's, it's entirely up to them what they say. Um, and I think it's noticeable that there are still one or two governments that haven't reported. I think actually the US still has chosen not to report, uh, which is uh, quite surprising. I mean, well, I, I guess it's understandable given the administration that you've had over the last few years, but hopefully the new administration will be uh, will be stepping up soon. Oh, that's a, it's a really good point. And it, it's quite true. I mean, when we look at the VNR, I remember the negotiations. I was invited even to Berlin, where Germany was trying to look at the universal periodic review as a model and try to come up with something at least at that level and that standard, not below that. But there, there are some differences, as you pointed out. One is, you know, the UPR is over three hours. Uh, the VNRs are 20 to 30 minutes. So it's hard to cover really a goal a minute and, and be substantive. And so I think we have fallen below. And I, you did raise a great point about it should be all 17 goals. And many states, of course, when they have been doing those reviews, sort of even started out as a tourism video. I mean, being from Hawaii, we can see it, where they start with the video talking about how wonderful they are, come visit, come enjoy, have our sustainable coffee, you know, and all these actions where the civil society is calling more for urgency, especially knowing that we're below a decade. And you brought up the great point too, it is a voluntary national review. So countries make that announcement. Usually it's around this time of the year when it starts. But then by January, we know who will appear in July, as you talked about. And it was true. The United States, one of the few that have not gone. Uh, China did its second one, I believe, this summer. A couple other countries are up to their third. 
And so it, it's definitely one of those aspects. In Hawaii, we organized a voluntary local review uh, last year. And at that, we actually did a, a VLR lab for an, over an hour and a half where all the Hawaii mayors, governor, also federal officials in the Congress spoke so that it was, what we were trying to find was really a model that's, it's not 30 minutes. It really has to be more like three times that at least 90 minutes. And we tried to do that at the local level. And we do believe of course, with the current administration, taking the steps on the Paris Agreement, working on the nationally determined contribution, the NDCs that probably will see the United States this year. And what we'll be looking at is how civil society can mobilize, especially in such a large country, to do a good job on all 17. And, and we've done it in Hawaii. We have really, we've made videos by high school students about each of the goals and what it looks like illustrating it in our islands. And that was exciting. We've indigenized the SDGs behind you. So they're in Olelo Hawaii, Hawaiian language, but also localized because we have a pigeon as well so that they're more really popular among the people and people know the 17 goals. And so we've done a lot and it'll be exciting to see how we can coordinate around the country. Are there some examples of best practices of VNRs that you think you could share either from the first ones or really the ones that just happened in the last week? Yeah, absolutely. Um, just just to come back for a second on the moment in New York, I think you you hit on something really important, which is that it it was something that actually has been raised again. So just in this last year, there was a review of the VNR process, and many member states themselves were highlighting that the time given for the VNRs is too short, as you say. I mean. Every country is expected to give this full report in only, well, the actual presentation is only 10 minutes. And then you have maybe five to 10 minutes for questions and then five to 10 minutes to respond. So as you say, the whole thing is half an hour, which is incredibly limited when you're talking about an entire transformative agenda. Um, and so there does need to be more time. Um, that was raised. It was actually raised again uh, during the VNRs this time by one of the co-chairs of ECOSOC, um, the ambassador from Mexico, Ambassador Sandoval, where he himself said this is a ridiculously short time. Um, but we were pleased that we insisted with the UN that even with that tight time, it was important to have at least one uh, statement from uh, a major group or stakeholder, uh, an NGO, a civil society representative, to be able to make a point so that it's not only the government's point of view, but we do hear at least one voice, uh, independent voice, um, with a question to that government. And I think there have been some good examples of where that's been uh, used quite effectively, even if it is only a two minute intervention. Um, of course, we would really continue to push to have more time. Um, but as you say, it's not just that moment in New York, it's a much longer process. And as you say, it starts already uh, August, September, governments start coming forward. Certainly by the end of the year, as you say, the next round of governments will be agreed. Um, and we as civil society need to mobilize at the national level while those discussions are happening. And as Action for Sustainable Development, one of the things that we do is we provide some capacity building uh, you know, webinars, but we also provide a little bit of direct resourcing uh, for national coalitions to be able to run their own consultations alongside the official process. And there have been some great examples. Um, I mean, one good example actually last year was in India, where again, it's a very big country, um, as you say, like in the US and, and a very diverse population. And so they were able to run, um, I think 17 different consultations around the country looking at the different thematic areas with different constituency groups, so specifically consultations with Dalit communities, indigenous communities, women's rights activists, so really making sure that they were hearing voices from all of those different communities that are not normally heard and in different parts of the country, not just relying on one kind of meeting in the capital. You know, you really need to get out and hear those uh, voices from different parts of the country. Um, interestingly, this year, Zimbabwe did quite a quite a strong process. Um, and there were two big networks in Zimbabwe. One is called the, the National Association of NGOs, Nango. And then there's another one that focuses specifically on uh, poverty reduction, the Poverty Reduction Forum Trust. And they came together and ran a very wide series of consultations as well. Um, and I think Zimbabwe is an interesting place. They've had a recent change of administration. They're also trying to show that they're re-engaging with the international community. So there was a little bit of a window for some uh, potential dialogue there. 
Um, Sierra Leone was another strong example. And Sierra Leone is one of those countries that's now doing its third VNR already. And I think they see the SDGs as a kind of blueprint to come out of the fragile state and the conflict that they've had in their past. You know, this is a way for them to, uh, you know, set set their their future uh, direction. Um, and so the government there take it very very seriously. Um, you've also had countries like uh, Mexico, uh, Colombia, quite a few in Latin America this year, actually, Guatemala, Paraguay, uh, even where um, it's not always easy for civil society voices to be heard. Um, but we are very keen to try to make sure that even if they're not heard in the official statements, even if the government eventually doesn't include the inputs from civil society, we can still uh, promote uh, independent reports. And Colombia is another good example of that, where this year we know that there's a lot of conflict happening in Colombia. There are, you know, uh, unre there's unrest and uprisings at the moment, but still the civil society groups were able to organize themselves, come together, come up with a clear statement, their own independent assessment, not pressured by the government. Um, and that's really essential that, you know, even when it's a, a difficult environment that we hear those independent voices and that they can also speak um, at the highest levels at the UN. And it is exciting because it is in the VNR that they directly speak to maybe the presentation by the government or highlighting some of the issues that maybe were ignored. But then there's also the exciting aspect of the high level political forum with so many panels. So it's a two week really extravaganza of an exchange between everyone on earth about what is our common future. And maybe you could highlight a bit some of the high level political forum, how that's evolved, uh, what were some of the ways that civil society's voice was able to be heard in that process. I know there's the thematic aspects in that first week, and then we get more into the VNRs in the second. But there's so many exciting things going on. Maybe you could share some of the ways civil society is most involved. Yeah, I agree with you. And I, I, I like the way you, you set it out as a kind of a meeting for all of humanity to, to come together. And I mean, as we've seen over these uh, five, six years since the, the goals were agreed, each year those thematic uh, days, the first half of the week, um, ha has often led to some quite interesting uh, juxtapositions where you've had discussions on, as you said, um, you know, water cleanliness alongside oceans, you've had discussions around human rights and gender, you've had discussions on education and access to, you know, jobs and employment and sort of bringing together those thematic areas that complement each other. Um, but at the same time, um, I think it's unavoidable that in the last couple of years, the main focus has been on the pandemic um, and how we build that recovery. And so a big part of the discussions both last year and this year has been around resilience and recovery and what does a recovery look like? How do we build a recovery that actually leaves no one behind? Um, and what is potentially exciting, and I mean, maybe I'm I'm optimistic, I'm, I'm hopeful still, but you know, there is a possibility that the SDGs and the kind of underlying transformative change that, that is somehow captured in the SDGs should be the way forward out of the pandemic. And actually the pandemic might be the final trigger that we need for people to wake up and realize that we've got to be much, much bolder with the transformation. So I think what had been happening in the last five years was very piecemeal, very small. You know, a lot of the goals are not being reached. Um, and maybe this is the final push that forces people to realize that yes, you know, human health, the environment um, and the economy are inextricably linked. And we, if we want to make sure that people are healthy and safe, they also need to have a future that is sustainable and not reliant on fossil fuels. And maybe this is the moment where we can, we can push that change through. It's true, the, the SDGs are really a recipe for the moral revolution that we need because it points out everything, the pandemic exposes it, but the SDGs provided that process for a participatory, proactive, really philosophy and practice to change how people and planet interact and to see that we are all one. And, and that's one of the aspects we can look at, especially as we see the pandemic continuing to ravage around the world, it, we are one. And if you have to have no poverty, you have to have zero hunger, you have to have clean water, you have to have quality education, you have to have housing, you have to have all these aspects or the world will continue to spiral in the direction that no one wants to live in. But these 17 
global goals provide in a way a framework that's a foundation for a future that everyone wants. And the pandemic has shown us that we have to have all 17 because if we don't and we ignore them and you brought up earlier and we can maybe close out with it, but the leave no one behind and furthest behind first. Those were very powerful points. And it also then challenges the model of development and it puts dignity at the center and makes sure that all policies rooted in human rights. So that high level political forum is that space where we all come together, but it's also that time where we reckon with, with how we can coordinate. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And, and you highlighted, I mean, goal one, zero poverty, goal 10 uh, on reducing inequalities. And what's interesting for me when I've looked at the VNRs is quite often people talk about goal one on zero poverty, but they don't link it to goal 10 on inequalities. And so although it may be that in some countries, absolute poverty uh, is, is reducing, at the same time, the very wealthy are continuing to get wealthier and wealthier. So the gap from the bottom to the top is, is even bigger than it's ever been. And unfortunately, in the pandemic, we've seen that continuing. And so I think you're right to highlight dignity, human dignity, the importance of those who do have uh, more in society do bear uh, a responsibility. And as you say, it's a moral responsibility to then share that resource, particularly in an emergency. Um, and I think another good example of that is the the vaccine equity and the question that uh, so many countries like the UK, where I'm sitting now, have stockpiled huge supplies of the vaccine far beyond what they need for their own population, while in many other parts of the world, people still haven't even had access to the first vaccine. I think it's not more than about one or two percent in many yeah. countries. And so that is just shocking to me. And I, I, I cannot understand how our leaders would not see, as you say, that if we want to uh, resolve this pandemic, we have to take everyone with us. It's a, it's a global uh, situation and that requires global solutions. And, and hopefully, I mean, that is uh, what I hope is that our politics will start to look in that, in that way towards solidarity, towards identifying our common humanity, rather than the kind of, uh, you know, putting your own national interest first and ignoring the others. I think, you know, it's so important now that we identify better ways to collaborate, better ways to build that, that society in which uh, everyone is, is uh, able to have opportunities and, and can thrive going into the future. It's true. I mean, you've really covered today the aims and aspirations, the ambitions and the actions, and what more we can do on accountability. And really also bring up, it's true, we almost have vaccination apartheid, and we have to work on all those issues all at the same time. But the SDGs provide the way that we can do that. The VNR is a space that we can measure and monitor and mobilize around. And the HLPF is a way to continue to even inspire as you've done today with your optimism of how we can continue to organize and achieve. I think the, the final aspect that we can look at, of course, is, is the new partnerships around 17, where it's no longer just that traditional model. And I know here we've done a voluntary university review. We started with a pilot. A couple of schools have said they want to do VSRs, voluntary school reviews. So it is exciting how the VNR process gave birth to a VLR, and now there's a VUR. And it, it's exciting to see how civil society will continue to coordinate campaigns. Yeah, I mean, one of the models that we've been using, as you know, is a, is a people scorecard. Um, and I'd love to make that available to anyone else who'd like to pick that up. And the idea of the people scorecard, I mean, so far it's been mainly used for a national level independent assessment, but there's no reason why it couldn't be picked up by groups that wanna apply the goals to their own context. Um, the idea is that you send out a survey on each of the goals to the stakeholders who are most relevant to you. So it could be used at a local level, it could be used by a community organization to assess their own impacts. Um, and as you say, I mean, this is what's so versatile about the goals is that they can be applied at so many different levels. And actually, I think you're right that the real transformation needs to happen closer to where people's everyday lives are. So at the at the local and grassroots level, that's where the change is really gonna happen. But it has to, of course, be facilitated by uh, national governments that understand it and that open the doors and that enable that transformation to happen. Well, Lee, thank you so much. And there's so much more we can say. We'll definitely continue this conversation during this 2030 agenda time period of the next decade. And we appreciate your time with us here in Cooper Union. 
And until next time we get to meet in person, thank you so much for continuing all of the work to make the world a better place. Mahalo. Thank you so much. Wonderful to be with you. See you soon.